Today we're going to conclude our series on earnestly contending for the faith out of Jude, verse 3. Uh, Jude was going to write about this salvation that's available to all whosoever will receive. But he said, I felt it needful to, to write you and to exhort you that you earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And this is, if I could sum everything up of what we've been talking about, a lot of what's being preached today in America is not faith at all. Um, and I don't mean this critically, it's just observation. A lot of our pulpits have turned into places to get motivational sermons, life coaching, uh, inspirational sermons, sermons and things like that. And it's very subtle of the enemy because they can motivate you, they can inspire you. But the, the result is when the Word of God is not being preached, when, when a pastor is not preaching the Word instead of getting a message and then sprinkling in some Bible parts to reinforce his message, then faith's not coming because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One translation I found said, God was the Word. God is the Word. So God and His Word are one and the same. So faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And if I will preach the Word of God, if any pastor will preach the Word of God, people will be motivated. They will be encouraged but you've got to make sure that the Word of God is getting out. So we, uh, during this last week, started talking about the law of faith. And faith is a law. It's not a roll of the dice. It's not like going to Las Vegas and hoping you do good and hoping you win the big jackpot. Faith is a law. It's, uh, let me define what a law is for us. It's a law is something that is fixed and unchanging. It's a formal system of binding forces and effects that produce and reveal predictable outcomes. So we understand it in the natural. So you have laws of aerodynamics that are always acting upon an aircraft. Now the law of gravity dictates that you and I are bound to the earth unless we can bring a law in that supersedes that law. And there is. It's called the law of lift. And the way that the law of lift is generated is you have thrust over drag and then you have lift over weight. And when, when those forces are put in a certain motion, you create lift. Now, we also talked about when a, when a pilot takes off, he's looking for opposition. And so I say it this way, when you're in an airplane and you know they're taxiing out, just know that pilot's looking for opposition. That is the opposing wind. Pray he finds it. So when you have opposition against you as a man or woman of faith, just praise God for it because it cannot stop you. It will actually, if you walk by faith and enact the law of faith, it'll, it'll work to raise you up and give you lift in the things of God. So Psalm, or I'm sorry, Romans 3.27 says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works. No, but by the law of faith. So faith is a law. It's not a hope so thing, a maybe so thing. If you will enact the correct and proper things regarding faith, you will see results. It's impossible not to. So let's go back. We'll, we'll go down to uh, Mark chapter 11 and verse 22 again. Uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 22. They had just come back and seen that the fig tree, Peter in verse 21 said, calling to remember it, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree, which thou cursed is withered away, in verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Now, we know that there is a difference between human faith and the God kind of faith. And then Jesus goes on and tells us how to see mountains moved. What does that mean? A mountain is anything you're facing right now that is beyond your ability to deal with in your own strength. 
So I live here in Colorado. If we go right out the front doors of this building, we'll see the entire front range. We'll see Pikes Peak. And you could hand me a shovel, a good shovel. You could even give me a bunch of earth moving equipment and front end loaders. And I'm telling you what, you're not gonna move those mountains. Those are called the Rocky Mountains for a reason. There's solid granite in there. That's something that never in my lifetime would I be able to move those mountains. But when you step into the God kind of faith, what Jesus is trying to communicate after Peter saw the fig tree withered away, he decided to make that a lesson and say, for verily I say unto you, and that means, that's an emphasis. That means what I'm telling you is the truth. I'm about to share something with you that is the truth. He then starts telling them how to operate in the God kind of faith. The first thing we know is words are important. You are never going to rise above the level of your confession. you got to realize your faith is not going to get any further than your words take it. You know, right now we're in, we're in here taping and we've got air running. Um, you know, we've got devices that generate heat. So there are thermostats in this room and there's two functions of that thermostat. It's got a thermometer and that tells us where the temperature is. Then it's got the thermostat and that will change and adjust the temperature. So what often people do is they become a thermostat in the kingdom. They're just reporting what the conditions are when all the while, according to Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24, Jesus said, I've made it so you can move mountains. You can change things. And how do we do that? Well, um, even more so today, we understand that Words are important because I've got a smartphone here that's voice activated. You know, there's times I've been having a conversation with somebody over a lunch and this, this smartphone will talk to me and ask me a question. It'll ask me what I said or it will think I said something. So this thing is listening, whether you know it or not. I have heard, even if we turn these things off, they can still hear us. And we know where that's going. After the church is raptured out of here, we know where things are headed with the Antichrist and the control. But this issue of artificial intelligence is really getting interesting. And uh, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. I mean, I think I was in junior high when that movie came out, but there was a computer called HAL. And HAL got to take it over. And pretty soon, Hal did take over. And uh, what we're finding is that basically, the further along we got, the more that we see technology represents and reflects the realm of the Spirit. You know, I've been saying for years, long before the smart devices and tablets and all that stuff were, you know, as available and prevalent as they are, that life is voice activated. Life is voice activated. The spiritual realm is voice activated. Demon forces are listening. Angelic forces are listening. When we speak life, then I believe the angelic forces of God kick into being. You know, I, I talk about even before our family really came to know the Lord, we were Lutherans. My dad was a Lutheran, but we were my, my parents are God-fearing people. My mother was so godly, it's her prayers that she used to pray over me uh, as a little baby. You know, it was so strange to me when I got out of high school and the Lord began to deal with me and I had a heart to serve God. And then I saw myself heading toward ministry, didn't know what I was going to do. I just wanted to help. And then when I find myself in full-time ministry, I thought, boy, this is really interesting. That just wasn't in my heart. It wasn't part of it. And then I found out maybe 15 years before my mom died that she used to rock me as a little baby and pray, God, I pray that you'll use Mark in your kingdom. I still have that little rocking chair that she used to sit in and rock me. And, and so her faith affected me. I believe her faith closed the wrong doors in my life and opened the right doors in my life. And so this faith that Jude tells us to earnestly contend for, it's once delivered to the saints, 
as a born again child of God, it's residing in you. And in this closing lesson, I just want to encourage you and uh, prompt you how to start seeing it released in your life. Number one, control the words of your mouth. Choose the words of your mouth carefully. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So there is something about it that when you continually speak in a vein, that those things are going to begin to happen. Things will begin to happen. Many people's faith is not working today because their mouth is contrary to the desires of their heart and what they're wanting to see. So here's a challenge for us. Begin to take a little bit of an inventory of what we're saying out of our mouth. Would the words of you, would the sum total of your words in a day be what you want to come to pass? Be careful that when you're joking around, you don't use poverty, sickness, and death to express yourself. Begin to speak words of life. Begin to speak words of blessing, prosperity. Speak words of health. Speak words of victory. You know, I realized that there were times I was saying things, then I'd go talk to the Lord about different things, and He said, well, that's your problem. You are speaking those things continually. And so if we think about it right now, there's, there's a certain amount of cool air flowing and it's, it's a blessing. We came in here the other day, it was a little bit too hot. And so I went over and looked at the thermometer and I saw, yeah, it's hot in here. And so I adjusted the thermostat. So when you go adjust a thermostat on your wall, in effect, that is calling things that be not as though they were. So let's say it's 78 degrees in here, and then we want it to be 72 degrees. So I go plug in 72 degrees. Somebody could walk up and say, well, that you plugged in 72, but it's not 72 in here, it's 78. Well, we understand the laws of nature, that's okay, because we understand we're calling things that be not as though they were. We're calling for this room to come into alignment was 72 degrees. And so the thermostat may say 78, but we're not moved by what we see or hear or feel. We're moved by what we plug in. So we plug into the thermostat, which sends a signal to the dynamo, which then causes the dynamo to power up. And then it begins to come in. And then it brings the temperature in the atmosphere into alignment with the desired setting. It's exactly what our words do. So the first thing you do is you get a hold of your words. In Mark eleven twenty three, there, Jesus talked about speaking three to one. The believing's the easy part. If you will get your words to align with the Word of God, then what you believe in your heart, what you hope and desire, those things will begin to come to pass. The next area is the imagination of your heart. According to Paul, your imaginations are the battleground. Imaginations affect everything about you. In Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, the Lord was talking to Abraham and he, sent, uh, he said this. He said, Abraham, lift up your eyes. Look north, south, east, and west. For as far as you can see, you can have. So what that tells us is you've got to guard your mind. You, you must take authority over your imaginations. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, 4, and 5, that we're not really fighting against people. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And he's talking about this spiritual warfare, and all of a sudden he goes, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So what does that mean? That means there should not be any imaginations or image formations allowed in your mind that are contrary to the revealed will of God. The Lord said He would take sickness from our midst. The Lord said He would bless us 
coming in and going out, that we're already blessed with all spiritual blessings, that He would supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory. And we could just keep going on down the list. No weapon formed against us could prosper. Every tongue that would rise us against us in judgment, we would condemn it, show it to be in the wrong. So what happens is when you encounter a spiritual battle, what where's that battle going on? Right here in the imagination. And some people may think, well, the devil doesn't know what I'm thinking and it's not that important. Oh, yes it is because the enemy is the author of the negative and vain imaginations and he knows if you're resisting him. So Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6 tells us about the Tower of Babel. And what they did was nothing they imagined could be restrained from them. I think one of the best books I've ever read by Andrew Womack is on imagination. It is powerful. And he ties it into the fact that's how he saw all of the buildings in the campus manifested up there in Woodland Park, he began to see it. And so we understand that our words are critical. It's the first thing God deals with Joshua on. It's the thing that Jesus says the first thing about moving mountains was speaking to it. So your words are important, but then your imagination. Your imagination is going to be key. If you can let me see the imaginations of your heart, I'll tell you your future. And, and one of the things is that, you know, you can choose what you desire to see in your future. You do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. When you meditate upon the Word of God, the Holy Spirit helps take the Word and make it become flesh in your life. So when we talk about faith, you know, sometimes we think it's going to be some spectacular thing, but it sometimes may not be spectacular at all. Some of the most powerful things I've ever seen were through the use of words and prayer. And uh, I remember one particular time, this was an eye opener for me. I'd just given my life to the Lord and I was really starting to follow hard after the Lord. And I had gotten the baptism in the Holy Spirit and I wasn't married at the time and, and I had a really awesome job. It was part time, but I made full time pay so that gave me time to study the Word like I never had before. And I'll never forget this. The enemy was just really, I came home one night and I just felt like I had like a headlock. Like I was battling condemnation. You know, there was this, this pervasive feeling that God was upset with me and mad at me. And I, I'm sitting there going, you know, I really don't believe that intellectually, but I'm fighting this. And I mean, I was really battling discouragement that night. And I came home and I, I just, and of course I was single at the time. I felt, like, I felt like crawling under the covers and staying there for about six months <clears throat> and just maybe praying and interceding and maybe I could, could uh, you know, get to doing better. And I'll never forget this, having been newly baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm sitting there and this still small voice said, I want you to begin to pray in the Spirit. And the funny thing, I didn't feel like praying in the Spirit. Nothing in me wanted to. I'd rather just go to bed and forget about it. And all of a sudden, reluctantly but obediently, contrary to everything I felt, I started praying in other tongues. And I kid you not, with no exaggeration, I would say within 45 seconds, it felt like an iron band broke off my head. And there was no smoke in the room, but it felt like there was a fog in there. And it seemed like that instantly cleared. And every bit of that oppression lifted off of me. Now that may not sound very exciting to you, but it was a breakthrough for me. It was off the chart. In that same home that I lived in, I, I had come home one night, and I'll never forget it. The sun had not set. It was a beautiful summer evening, and I had eaten something, and I had this favorite chair I used to like to sit in, and I'd read my Bible and read books or listen to tapes. And I'll never forget it. It's the strangest thing I've ever had happen. Hadn't had anything like it since or before that. 
And I sat there, and as soon as I leaned back in the chair like this, I became aware. It was like there was two dark beings in front of me. And I kid you not, the sun was not set yet. So it was daylight. It wasn't even dark. And I felt fear hit me. And it just like cold steel blades of fear went into me. It was the craziest thing that I had ever experienced. It was for no reason. I wasn't feeling like there were spiritual attacks going on or super spiritual or not so spiritual. But I'm telling you, it was very real to me. And all of what I'm going to tell you took place in just really a flash. I thought in my mind, I'm sitting there, what in the world? And here was the thought I had like that. I said, well, if, if the devil thinks he's going to sit here, he's going to hear the word of God. That's what I thought. And without really conscious thought, I opened my mouth and this, what, this is what came out. You ministering spirits that excel in strength, that hearken to the voice of his word. And that's as far as I got. And all I can tell you is from right behind me, it was like two beings of light came around and clashed right in front of me like a flash. And those two spirits were gone. And I was like, whoa. And the Lord showed me later what that was, was the sword of the Spirit, the rhema of God, part of the armor of God, because I'd hidden the Word of God in my heart. When I spoke it, they had to leave. And, and that's, that's a primary way that you begin to release your faith and walk. Thank you for watching this video and be sure to explore more of my YouTube channel for more content like this. Then if you want to learn more about what we do or if you want to partner with us, be sure to visit my website at markcoward.org. May the Lord bless you richly.